Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone out today. We have a number of our own that are traveling, such as the summer months, but then we have new friends and other people coming in to be with us today, and we're so glad that you're here. It is a warm, loving church family at Livingston, and it's always wonderful to come home to it, Miss Pepper, and uh, a number of others that we are so delighted to have with us today. Uh, brothers as we're, and sisters, as we're looking to the Word of God, I hope you will open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2 and the end of Philippians chapter 2, as we're going to be uh, looking at the Scriptures there in just a second. I, I do want to, <clears throat> before we get into the sermon, just say something from my heart. It seems like an appropriate moment to say it. For those of you in the congregation, you know that on a number of times, I have spoken and spoken quite sternly about the sin of abortion and about the laws of our land protecting it. And so I think it is only appropriate also to acknowledge that the other day a very good decision was made, the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I am not so naive to say, well, that's the end of abortion, or that's the end of this discussion, not at all. But it is a step in the right direction. And righteousness exalts a nation. And I am so thankful in my heart for the courage that that decision was made. And we'll see where it goes from there. I know as God's people, we have a lot of work to do to share the gospel with people in all different and even difficult circumstances in their life. But God sets before us a path. Choose life. Choose death. Choose life that you may live. I love you, brethren. I just want to share that thanksgiving from my heart. And perhaps it's a thanksgiving that you share as well. This morning, we are continuing our series, Worthy of Christ's Gospel, where we are preaching through the book of Philippians, and our plan is to continue, excuse me, to complete Philippians chapter 2 this morning. Uh, What Brother Bill just read and read so well for us, I find very compelling. I find it very compelling because what it offers for us is so much backstory and immediate context for this book of the Bible. And you don't often get a whole lot of backstory and immediate context for a book in the Bible. But what has transpired? We have learned that the Apostle Paul is imprisoned. He is imprisoned in Rome. He's not alone there. Timothy is with him in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, Timothy's not a prisoner, but he's helping Paul, and he's serving Paul in that terrible situation. And as the word of that imprisonment and distress gets all the way back to Philippi, the church at Philippi has moved. We want to help Paul. And so they collect a gift. They collect an offering, a lot of financial support. And they send it by the hands of one of their own preachers, Epaphroditus. He's a preacher. He might even be a bishop. We're told in Philippians 1 and verse 1 that there are bishops in that church. And uh, there is a tradition that he was a bishop. It be that as it may. He carries this gift all the way to Rome. And either along the way or shortly after getting there, he gets sick. He gets terribly sick. And he's sick for a while. I want you to appreciate that. What we just read is that he was sick for a long enough period of time that word of his sickness went all the way back to Philippi. And they said, oh no, Epaphroditus is sick. And they were sorrowful and they were upset and and, and they're troubled. And the word of their trouble and concern for Epaphroditus travels all the way back to Rome. And then Epaphroditus here that they're so worried about me and that makes him all the more sorrowful. And Paul says he's so sorrowful too because he is terribly sick even unto death. And what if he dies? And this fellow's even come to be here to help me anyway. It's a very difficult situation. But then God is so good and God is so merciful that Epaphroditus revives and Paul writes this book of Philippians, this letter. He puts it in Epaphroditus' hand and he has Epaphroditus take it back to the church. Boy, they were happy to see Epaphroditus. And he's got a letter from Paul. And when they read the letter of Paul, what do they read? Timothy is coming very soon. Well, he might already be on the road by the time Epaphroditus gets there. And not only is Timothy coming very soon, but Paul's hoping to be there as well. And all three of them, Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, they can all be there with the church at Philippi, and it'd be a wonderful thing. That's what Bill was just reading to us. Timothy, Epaphroditus. Some commentaries call these two a priceless pair. Why? Well, because these are men. These are ordinary men. But what is said of them, what is said of them is that they have the mind of Christ. The beginning of Philippians chapter 2, Jesus is the example of selfless humility and how he completely emptied himself. And the word to the Christian is, you have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
And a little later on in the chapter, in Philippians 2 and uh, verse, what is it, verse uh, 17? Yeah, Paul upholds himself as an example of humility. And he says, I'm pouring myself out as a drink offering. And, and you be humble like Jesus. And you be humble like Paul. And sometimes, don't you want to say, but it's hard to be like Jesus. He's the son of God. And it's hard. I'm sure Paul got that right. Because he's an apostle, you know. I'm sure he did. But then we come to Timothy. And we come to Epaphroditus. And you know what? They're ordinary men. They're ordinary saints. They're not apostles. They're not miracle workers. They're dedicated preachers and fellow workers with Christ. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says of Timothy, he is like-minded. They have the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2 and verse 25, he says of Epaphroditus, he is my fellow worker, fellow workers of Christ. And that's what I want to speak to you about for a few moments this morning. Because that's what we need to be, church. We need to be fellow workers of Christ. And it's not just the preachers. It's not just the bishops. But we are all called to have this mind of Christ. And so serve with Christ. Serve together and be fellow workers with Christ. Fellow workers of Christ. And so what are the attitudes, what are the actions of fellow workers of Christ? Well, that's what we see in this priceless pair. That's what we see in Timothy and Epaphroditus. And so that's what we're going to talk about for a few moments this morning. A fellow worker of Christ. The fellow workers of Christ. What do they look like? What do they do? Number one, fellow workers of Christ seek the things of Christ Jesus. That's their priority and their value. They seek the things of Christ Jesus. In Philippians 2 and verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Here is Timothy, and Paul says that Timothy is trustworthy in a time when it's hard for Paul to find some trustworthy help. You think about it. Where this letter begins, Philippians 1, verses 15 through 16. There are some preachers, and they are preaching from envy. And they are preaching to try to add burden to the Apostle Paul. They are not sincere. You get to the end of Philippians chapter 3, and you find out there are some saints, and their, their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. They are only seeking the things of this earth. That's not sincere. That's not trustworthy. But here in the middle is Timothy. And he says of Timothy, I have no one like-minded who will seek the things of Christ and not the things of their own. Timothy's like-minded. The mind of Christ. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, Philippians 2 verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And Timothy is like-minded with that. We can look at Timothy. Here is a selfless one, not driven by selfish ambition. We can look at Timothy. He is humble, looking out for the interests of others and placing them above his own. Look at Timothy. Not an apostle, not Jesus, but a Christian man and a Christian man doing this well. A Christian man serving well. Paul trusts Timothy, so he's going to send Timothy all the way from Rome to Philippi. You're going on this work. And what I love about Timothy is he's willing to go. He's willing to go. Take the danger for the journey. I'll go. Yeah, I'm a little bit sick. I got these stomach problems, but whatever. I'll go. I'll go. It's inconvenient. It's a distance. I'll go. Wouldn't it be more convenient to stay? Wouldn't his own interest and comfort be about to stay? But he's willing to go. He's seeking others' interests before his own. Now notice this in Philippians 2 verse 21. Philippians 2 verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But we're saying seek the things which are of Christ Jesus. Well then what are the things of Christ Jesus here? What are the interests of Christ 
What are those interests that he's going to place before his personal interests? What should we place before our personal interests? What are the things of Christ that should replace our envy or our selfishness or our worldly interests? Two things specifically in this text. Number one, the things of Christ or to know the condition of Christ's people. To know the condition of the people. Christ's people are the things of Christ. That's what Jesus is interested in. He's interested in the condition, the state, the situation of his people, of these people at Philippi. Paul is the apostle. He's so interested in how things are going there. And so there needs to be some communication. There needs to be some interest. There needs to be some time given to understand and get the picture of what's going on in this congregation. These people are Christ people. Christ is interested in them. And once you know about the things of Christ, once you know about his people in this situation, then sincerely care for the condition of Christ's people. Can sincerely care for it. Once he knows the state of the congregation, you know what Timothy can do? He can step in and go to work to bless them. To go to work to serve Christ and serve them. He is interested in their well-being. He is interested in their growth. He is interested in their fruitfulness. He is interested in seeing them built up in the word of God and the faith. And protecting them from false doctrine. He is interested in keeping them focused on their citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. And not getting caught up in worldly entanglements. He is interested in their good in caring for them. Timothy wants their best. To improve and enhance their state. And these are the things of Christ, his people, and the care for his people. And not our own things. And brethren, I hope we understand we're fellow workers to Christ. Not just the preachers, not just the bishops, not just the deacons. We are all encouraged to seek the things of Jesus Christ. And not our own things. Sometimes it's strange and a little bit of funny. A little bit of fun. It can be funny. What brethren will decide, these are my things, and i got to have my own things. You know, they got to seek out my own pew. And heaven help you if you're sitting in my pew. And, uh, in fact, you know why all these pews are empty up here? Out of town. And people are scared. They're scared to go sit in those pews. Because what if they showed up? No. My own pew, my own pew, that's really the splash zone, we know that. My own pew... Uh, Sometimes it's my own parking space. Oh, no, you didn't just get in my own parking space. It's funny sometimes. We just seek our own, and we'll do that in the the church, the things that come up. Sometimes it's a little more serious than that, though. We can kind of laugh about the pews. You know, sometimes brethren want to seek my way uh, above all in a dispute or a disagreement. Or some brethren want to insist that a whole church need to follow their judgment in an area of judgment or scruple, because obviously it is their judgment that is the best, and they must have their own way. And it certainly can happen that I can confuse my judgment, I can confuse my way, I can confuse seeking my own with Christ's way, or God's word. And uh, i got to be honest about that. i got to be discerning about that. And I don't want to fall into that trap. We don't want to be seeking our own. Even in the name of very spiritual things, we don't want to be seeking our own. We want to be seeking the things of Christ. In seeking the things of Christ, we need to know the condition of our brethren. The state of our brethren. I'm not talking about gossip. I don't believe Timothy was a gossip, do you? No, I'm talking about community. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the knowledge. What is it that my my brethren sharing the pew are going through right now? It's wonderful we have a bunch of guests here. And so I, I, I tell you what, your homework this afternoon is not to get the deep, dark secrets from whoever's sitting on the pew with you. But what if you introduce yourself and catch a name? That's pretty good. It could start with that. But for the local church, and in getting to know and appreciate the condition of, uh, of one another and where we are, what, what, what are the people in your Bible class rejoicing about right now? What are the people in your house-to-house group weeping about right now? You say, we, we share these things, and so we build an enhanced community. We get to know the condition of one another. We get to know the state of the congregation and where we are. 
We want to seek the things to know and to care about our brothers in the local church, physically as well as spiritually. You know, some things we try to do here, we try to keep people informed about what's going on. There's news and notes for the membership. We send out emails, um, you know, prayer requests and send cards or we need visits, things like this. We try to keep people informed and that's good and that's important. But we really start building community when we spend more time together. Worship, of course, but hospitality. Worship, of course, but maybe service projects or extra work together in good deeds times of sharing, times of prayer, it's, it's time together. And I know that this is a larger congregation at Livingston. And so I know that there are some uh, uh, victories that need to be celebrated, and there's some heartaches that need to be mended, and there are some temptations that need to be battled, and all that will be going on, rarely will everyone in the congregation know about it. Rarely, if ever. But we all need a few Timothy-type Christians. And we all need to be this Timothy-type Christian to others, to be fellow workers, to know and to be known, to help each other, to bless each other. That's what Timothy did because he came to know the community and serve, be fellow workers in that community. And we can care for the state of Christ's people. I do want to just commend this congregation you impress me so much this church family because when the word goes out that people need some meals there's been a tragedy or there's sickness or the word goes out that people need some service or maybe they just need a visit those lists they fill up so quick sometimes I'm surprised I hear word oh there's a list to sign up and I get online and I click on the list and it's already full you know there's such an eagerness to help enjoy and serve one another God bless you for it. God bless you for it, for caring for and responding to those needs. Our challenge to grow in this is to be like Timothy's, coming into Philippi, looking for the good that he can do. Our challenge then is to initiate good care and good service for the brethren. Initiate hospitality in those things. Let's be starters in these ways. To seek the things of Christ Jesus and not our own, we seek to know and to care for the state of Christ's people. But not only do the fellow workers with the mind of Christ serve in this way, number two. Number two. They serve. Number two. Serve with others in the gospel. The fellow workers of Christ serve, but with others in the gospel. Is your Bible open to Philippians 2? Let's look at verse 22. Philippians 2, verse 22. But you know his proven, we're talking about Timothy still, his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. I love this twofold commendation for Timothy. First, he says he's got a proven character. And the second, he served with me, with me, like a son to a father. Let's talk about character for just a moment. And the importance of character, fellow workers, fellow workers of Christ. It cannot be overstated. Not when we're speaking of serving in the gospel. I read once about evangelism and doing evangelism. I've actually read many times about this, but here's an illustration. When you're doing evangelism, when you're sharing the good news with other people, think of it like an airplane, and this airplane has two wings. One wing is your communication and your good communication of the gospel. But the second wing is your character. You're living consistently with the gospel. You know what an airplane needs to take off? It needs both wings. It's not one or the other. You've got to have both wings. And do you know what happens when you go flying through and you've got a fantastic, dynamic, amazing, effective gospel communication, but then that wing of character peels off. You know what happens? It's going to crash and burn, isn't it? It's going to crash and burn. And sadly, that is the story of some fellow workers. There has to be the character. Timothy has the character. When you don't live your convictions, when you don't practice what you profess or practice what you preach, that's a character problem. And the question is, brethren, my fellow workers of Christ, 
How is your character? Are you living it? Are you living it? Because it's not just apostles or Jesus with the proven character. Timothy had the proven character. The workers of Christ need the proven character. And Christian character and Christian service go hand in hand. Fellow workers serve, but we've got to have the character. We've got to be practicing it. The other thing that jumps out at me in Paul's commendation, I said the character, but it was this, how he served with others, right? How he serves with Paul, uh, with me, like a, like a son to a father, like a son to a father. The humble mind of Christ allows Christians to be together, to serve together, to work together in the gospel. And how important it is, because just like any kind of a team, and we're excited for our lightning, aren't we? They're hanging in there. And we're excited for our rays, and we're excited for our bucks, Champa Bay. We're excited. We, we get teams. We've got to remember in the church that much like a team, there are roles to play. Offices to be held, and your role in it is so, so important. You're not going to do the same. Not everybody in the Lightning is going to be the goalie. Not everybody in the Bucks is going to be the quarterback. No, they're not. But you've got to have them all. You've got to have them all. Um, there's no doubt that Paul had special affection for Timothy. He calls him a son in the gospel multiple times in the New Testament. Timothy submitted to the leadership of Paul. You know, in the church, we have to be submissive. We've got to be submissive to the leadership of the local congregation. We're supposed to be submissive to one another, submit to one another. And this, again, echoes the humble attitude of Christ, the mind of Christ. Does it not? It is so necessary that we might be able to serve with others. Paul taught Timothy how you need to behave in the church. And how you need to behave in the church is like it's your family. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Take heed to yourself, Paul writes to Timothy. Now Timothy's at Ephesus at this point, but by verse 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters with all purity. If we're going to work together in a church and, and live together as a church, it's important that we respect and love each other correctly in the church. And this according to Christ's doctrine. He said, pay attention to yourself and to your doctrine, to your teaching. And then in, as you are relating to your brothers and sisters in Christ, they really are your family. Older men are fathers. Younger women are sisters. You got brothers, you got mothers. What's that look like? Purity in these relationships. Loyalty in these relationships. I don't want you saying anything about my brother or my mother. And I knew that much before I was ever a Christian. <laughs> this is my family in Christ. I'll be loyal to you. There needs to be compassion. There needs to be understanding and long-suffering. There needs to be kinship. I want what's best for my family. Work together as a family. Behave in the church as a family. Another picture that he gives is work in the church as your part. Offer in the church your part of the body. Because you are part of the body of Christ. When you're part of the church of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 15. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Your role, your function, your place that you uniquely supply. Don't ever think that in the Lord's church, you don't matter. That you're just a number or a stat. Not in the Lord's church. Not in the Lord's church. You have your part. And we cooperate together in harmony for the good of the body. And we've got to learn to do that. And sometimes it's easier than others. 
And sometimes brethren have made people skeptical that it could happen. Hate to say it. So I was on an island nation of Dominica a few years ago doing some preaching. And I'm talking to some of the brothers on the island there about where I was preaching and what it was like in Middle Tennessee. And I told them about how there, well, there were two preachers there and I was in this two preacher arrangement. And this brother on the island, he goes, that's no good, brother. There is only room for one crab in a shell. <laughs> well, I guess if your preachers are crabby, I don't know. I, the, some of that island logic, I guess. But you, I, he, just, he, he just couldn't accept that there would be more than one preacher working with a local church. And I've reflected on that many years, and it tickles me till, still today. But you know, eldership, multiple elders, they're all supposed to work together and do great. Deacons. They're all supposed to work together and do great. Preachers are supposed to come in and work with all the saints and the elders and the deacons. I guess you ought to be able to work with other preachers too. I guess you ought to. I think about this church at Rome where they already had a Paul and a Timothy. And what do they did? Well, they sit in Epaphroditus. They got an Epaphroditus going back to Philippi. And who's on their way? Timothy and probably Paul. You know, they're ganging up on them. <laughs> but the preachers are going to be working together. The elders are going to be working together. We all got to learn to work together. We all got to work together. So fellow workers of Christ, we seek the things of Christ Jesus. We serve with others in the gospel with character and in our role, what we can supply for the good of the church, for the good of the work. What else do we see from this priceless pair? Well, let's turn our attention to Epaphroditus and let's see how fellow workers in Christ, fellow workers of Christ strive despite sickness and sorrow. Philippians 2 verse 25. Philippians 2, verse number 25. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Striving despite sickness and sorrow. Why did Epaphroditus make that trip to Rome in the first place? Because Paul had some sorrows. Here he was imprisoned. And uh, the Romans weren't kind to their prisoners. There was going to be serious deprivation, deprivation unless there would be people to come and help and supply the prisoners. That's sorrow. And then you've got Epaphroditus with his sickness. And then he might die, and that'd be adding sorrow unto sorrow. Here's all these fellows together. They're doing good, doing the Lord's work. But there's sickness and sorrow, and they're striving through all of that. Can I tell you... I read this a couple times. I even talked to Edwin about it. It doesn't quite make sense, does it? It doesn't quite make sense how Epaphroditus is so sick and Paul didn't heal him. And Paul was so sorrowful that he was so sick. But Paul didn't heal him to alleviate those sorrows. Is that curious? Now, it seems like there was prayer and an outcry of support and concern, but what we don't have is a miracle healing. And I began to study on that a little bit and discover that Paul did not heal all of the sick. It's kind of interesting. He starts ticking off some names, people that you could know about and people that you could pray for, but he left Trophimus sick at Miletus. He left him, he left him sick. Didn't heal him? Uh, Timothy. He's sick. He's got some stomach problem. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, he's told to drink some wine medicinally. Well, why not just heal him? Epaphroditus, we're reading about here. Apparently, Epaphroditus was laid up for a while. Why not heal him? Or Paul himself, wrestling with a thorn. he heal it why couldn't he or why didn't he heal it where's the miracle healing even for a preacher well begin to learn and discover that miracles had a purpose a very important purpose but a limited purpose and that is Paul uh, we, we should not understand that miracles were done regularly 
or that miracles were done for the sake of miracles, even in the New Testament. But they were performed sparingly and with a purpose, and those purposes come clear to us in the Scriptures. Miracles were done to accompany God's Word in Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4, to demonstrate that it was the Word from God. God's messenger is accredited by the power of God. Similarly, miracles verified God's apostles. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 12, the Apostle Paul said, I have worked all the signs of an apostle. Why did people come to believe that they, uh, Paul was an apostle? Well, in part, according to him, it's because he'd done all these miracles at some point. But miracles were not indefinite. Miracles serve those purposes. And so once you have scripture that you can trust, once you know who your apostles are, those things cease. We often understand that once the apostles died, there were no more miraculous spiritual gifts because there was nobody to lay hands and pass those things on. But I'm reading this, and it may well be before all the apostles were dead, there were a lot fewer miracles because the purposes of the miracles had been fulfilled. You know this is God's word. You know these are God's messengers. So other things have to be learned. Christians were learning in the first century that this life holds sickness and sorrow, and there will not always be miraculous deliverance from the situation. When we need this account of Aphrodite, Epaphrodite, we need this account because, again, ordinary man, ordinary man. And in this world, there will be sickness and sorrow, and there will be tribulation. And the workers together in Christ will strive to serve and serve the gospel despite the sickness, despite the sorrows. Talk to people about becoming Christians, but the one thing I can't tell them is, oh, when you're baptized and you become a Christian, you get a pass on all the sickness and on the sorrow. You're a Christian, you never be as sick again. You're a Christian, you never have sorrow or heartache again. It, it's all gone once you become a Christian. I can't say that because it's not true. There are some teachers today who, who really teach a, a terrible doctrine. And they tell people, if you're sick today, you know what your problem is? You don't have enough faith. If you had more faith, you'd be healed. You wouldn't be sick. Oh, you, you've got sickness. You've got problems. Well, you may not even be a real Christian. Oh, you, you've got sickness. Well, then there must be some awful sin in your life. Stop lying to me about it. Confess. Stop lying to me about it. Confess. Stop lying to me about it. Confess. And they play those games hurt people. And I would just say, well, tell that to Epaphroditus. Terrible sickness befalls Christians. It does not mean the gospel isn't true. Terrible sickness befalls Christians. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Terrible sickness befalls Christians. It doesn't mean you did something wrong and you deserve this sickness. Most sickness is quite amoral in our society. Here's what we need to learn. That we need to seek the things of Christ and to aid each other. It's one, it's one of the reasons we ought to be workers together in the gospel because this is a world where there's sickness and sorrow and we see people going through it. We're workers together in the gospel because this world is not our home. We are passing through. We're workers together in the gospel because this world is marred by sin, by evil, and with it suffering and pain, death. But we have the answer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that men and women must have because it is the gospel that will bring joy. It is the gospel that will bring forgiveness. It is the gospel that will bring hope and it is the gospel that brings eternal life. We are about serving together because of the sorrow, because of the sickness and we're striving through it too. What we have are unique opportunities as Christians when we become aware of our brothers and sisters in Christ in their sorrow and their sickness, or our neighbors that we love, whoever it may be, but we have a, a place as individual Christians to be ministers of God's mercy through prayer, through service to the sick and to the sorrowful. God's not failing us because there's sickness in the world. God has the answer, it is the gospel. And so we serve. And so we serve. 
One last point from Epaphroditus, and the lesson is yours. We were talking about the attitudes and the behaviors of the fellow workers of Christ. And as we finish reading our paragraph in verse 29, Philippians 2, verse 29, Receive him, that's Epaphroditus, receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, some versions say risking his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. The fellow workers of Christ are esteemed for their work. He says, honor him, esteem him. Epaphroditus is to be honored. Wow. He says, well, he risked his life for the gospel and he risked his life to serve his brethren. He came sick and unto death. And I know sometimes we can get a little bit of squeamish to think about honoring Christians because you sure don't want to honor them too much. And for good reason. You try to compliment a brother or a sister and they say, I'm, I'm doing this for the praise of God, not the praise of men. All right. Uh, well, yeah, now be careful now, because the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Don't go oh, holding up my right hand, right? Uh, I'm supposed to be humble, 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 and honoring somebody doesn't sound humble, and we don't want to feed pride or give anybody the big head. What we learn, fellow workers of Christ, is that they are worthy of recognition from time to time. And I'm not sure what it looks like, but I'm sure there's a time and a place for it because I read about this in Epaphroditus. They told him to do it, and Paul wasn't wrong. I do know this, the fellow workers uh, of Christ are role models. Role models are people that we esteem. Who is your role model? spiritual role model, someone you're looking up to? Can I use the word a hero? I'm very thankful for godly men who are qualified and appointed to be our bishops in this church. We esteem them and we love them for their work's sake. And I'll tell you, I am thankful for the tireless work of the many deacons and the teachers and the other workers around this church. And I don't say thank you enough and I don't commend you enough. I gain so much from Brother Edwin and working with him and his teaching and his efforts, I get a lot out of it. And I want to do my part also. Here's what I'd say about all these. We could kind of sum it up with the word leaders. And leaders understand that they're role models. Leaders understand that people are looking up to them and people want to follow them. That's what leaders understand and they better not forget it. I find Timothy and Epaphroditus so compelling because the Lord is the Christian's model but they're model Christians. And again, it's not that they're Jesus and it's not that they're an apostle. It's not that they're mighty miracle workers. They're faithful brothers in Christ who had a mind of Christ and were serving together in Christ and kept on serving through sickness and sorrow. Who is your role model in the faith? Maybe in our study today, you would say Abraham, you'd say David, you'd say Peter. Maybe in our study today, you'd add them. You'd add Epaphroditus. They're good, they're good. But sometimes I need one that I can hug. Who's the one you can hug? I'll share with you one last verse and the lesson's yours. Whether or not brothers and sisters in Christ are ever esteemed, there is someone who knows and there is a great reward. In Philippians chapter four and verse three, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Epaphroditus was called a fellow worker. Timothy's called a fellow worker. Where are their names? In the book of life. And what's wonderful about the gospel, it is the invitation to have your name written in the book of life. 
We don't work all of our lives serving God, hoping that one day he'll write our name in the book of life. It's the power of the gospel that when we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins and added to his church, added to Christ, then he writes our name in the book of life. And then we go to work. And then we go to serve him. And we are workers together for Christ. Thank you so much for your good attention. If you want to put your Bibles away, put your notes away, Brother Stephen's going to come and lead us in a song. A lot of Christians in the room today. How's your service? How's your mind? Let us have a mind of Christ. Let us serve with others, with one another for Christ. Let us persist. Let us strive. Even in the hard times, we can lean on one another for those times. Are you here this morning and you're not a Christian? You're here this morning and you'd like to be a worker with the Lord? You want your name written in the book of life? We're going to sing a song right now. And if you'd come forward and confess Christ... Put him on in baptism, he'll write your name in the book of life. You'll leave here in the Lord, write with the Lord, and you'll be a worker, you'll be a servant in the Lord. The wonderful spiritual family here that loves you and loves the Lord, and we're going to encourage one another to serve. If we can help you to baptize you into Jesus or pray for you, encourage you about any spiritual need, we invite you to come forward now. Together we stand and sing. Won't you come?